Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know Friday evening is not, you know, is not an ideal to, time to do a lecture, um, but we thought we would do this before the, um, the event tonight. And I'm thrilled that Diane Madden is here because she can add things. <laughs> She's been working with the students and, and, and she can add things. Um, this is something I put together, actually I initially put it together for a whole week in Philadelphia that I was doing last fall. And um, I've always thought of Tricia as very paradoxical in a lot of different ways. Um, and w a couple of the ways that I'll set out is, she's really very daredevil in how she arranges things, how she arranges sort of near crashes and, and near misses. And, and paired with that daredevilness is this serenity. And it's like Zen and the girl who climbed trees, you know, all put together. Um, also, when I was learning her movement, I felt it was your learning movement, like where it comes from, where it initiates from. But when you watch Trisha do the movement, it's like a liquid. It's like you're trying to catch something that's just keeping going, going. So, um, and I think that liquid quality has influenced a lot of different people. Um, as Donald was saying, you know, he worked with Bill T. Jones and he could see some of those influences. Um, and then a later development was when Trisha went into the proscenium stage. And to me, part of that paradox was she treated the proscenium stage as a site-specific situation. It was like, what, what are the wings? What is the proscenium? Nothing was assumed. It wasn't like, okay, you come out, you face the audience, and you're on stage. And, um, and I think in a way some of that has to do with Merce Cunningham, where you didn't assume front. There could be, you know, the no fixed points. You could, you could perform in the round. So Tricia had lots of ideas of how you could perform differently from walking into a theater. Um, so those are some of the, some of the sort of paradoxes that, that I was thinking of. And I'm, I'm going to start with, um, we can turn these lights off now so you can see these pictures. Um, so this is probably the first piece Trisha did. Um, there were, there were pe oh, wait a minute, sorry, turn the lights back on. I forgot to say a whole other thing. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk about Anna Halperin and how Trisha, for, she was born in the Northwest and was very, you know, nature girl. She went to the woods all the time. She went fishing. And so when she started studying with Anna Halperin, there was, um, to my mind, there was a synergy there um, hi, Carrie Ann. <laughs> um, th Charlotte, can you still see? Yeah, yeah. So, Anna Halperin, if you know anything about her, she, she insisted on doing all her practice outdoors when it wasn't raining, and it was all about, it was all about touching the earth, being with trees, um, uh, feeling the air, feeling the motion of nature around you rather than the stillness of a studio. And um, so Tricia studied with her in 1960, and that was also the summer that Yvonne Rayner studied with her, and Sally Gross, and um, June Ekman, and Simone Forti had been studying with, with Anna Halpern for several years by that point. Um, and it was... Uh, Trisha had been at Mills where some of the music people that dealt with, that were working with Anna Halpern were also at Mills. Um, I think Lamont Young was there. Not totally sure about that. Um, uh, so Trisha knew Simone that summer and Simone is the, per Simone Forti is the person who really brought a lot of Simone, a lot of Anna Halpern's ideas to New York and the Merce Cunningham Studio and the Bob Dunn Composition class. Um, so besides the connection to nature, there was also this feeling of task performance rather than proscenium performance. So that was another way that Tricia melded with, um, with Anna Halpern. Um, so this piece, I'm gonna show you the first, the first slide is of Trillium. The sound for Trillium was Simone, Simone Forti doing some kind of wild sound 
um, that was sort of taken from the deck of Simone Forti. It was a way for Tricia to bring that into this. And in Susan Rosenberg's book, um, she has a picture of that reel-to-reel -reel audio tape, um, which I'm trying to find out, like, where is that thing? Um, so, this is, so this is Trillium, which was done. Now you can turn off the light, thank you. So I wanted the first picture to be an upside-down picture because another thing about Trisha was she loved being disoriented, and she wanted dancers who could easily be disoriented. She also took acrobatics and gymnastics as a child. And in one of the Grand Union sessions, she said, I was good at acrobatics. So that she could always do, like, be upside down. And this structure was really just improvising with sitting, standing, and lying down. And that's all it was. And then when Jill Johnston reviewed it, it sounded like this incredible daredevil thing because Trisha would try to bring sitting and standing and lying simultaneously. So she ended up being sort of levitating, um, which was something that happened on Anna Halpern's deck, which was a famous moment where in their task things, and Trisha had the task of sweeping the deck, the wood on the deck. And both Yvonne Rayner and Simone Forti describe She's, she's sweeping and sweeping, and this broom goes out, and Trisha is like following the broom into the air. And that's a moment that neither of them could ever forget, and there's incredible dis descriptions of that moment. And so Trisha would talk about, oh yes, I levitated on that deck. So, but, and there were many ways in which she was trying to be horizontal, and Diane, can, Diane was the, I almost said victim, Diane was the example <laughs> of many of those ways of being horizontal, which would repeat through the years in, in Trisha's work. Um, so this was, and she showed this at Connecticut College, which was ADF, American Dance Festival, and the teachers there, Louis Horst and Bessie Schoenberg, did not think it was dance, they didn't want to choose it, they thought the music was awful, and Trisha had to kind of, um, educate them in terms of chance procedures. Um, okay, let's see the next one. So this is at Judson Church, and this is a piece, Light Fall, with, with Steve Paxton, and um, they would sit on each other's back and just sort of slide off. And partly what's interesting to me is that gravity was so important to Tricia, and Steve did that with her, and you can, you can just go right from there to contact improvisation. Um, the touch, and the touch, a lot of that is from Anna Halpern and Simone Forti, because um, there wasn't like a lot of touching in Bob Dunn's composition class. Um, and she was interested in what the weight would do, and you can see her face again. She just loved being disoriented, you know, off balance and, and disoriented. Um, okay, next one. Um, this one, Plains, never looked like that because it always had a film projected onto it. And before this was made, Simone Forti did a whole set of pieces called Dance Constructions, and one of them was called Slant Board. And Simone had this board that was like 45 degrees slanting, and people had to go with ropes and go over and under each other. So in a way, and, and Simone was in the original one of this, and she did the sound, which was whistling. And so Trisha took that slanted board and made it almost vertical, just slanted a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so those are, what do you call those, air, potholes or peg holes or something? Yeah. And you've done that piece, right? Yeah, I think that's me. On the upper right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but, but you, so it was, that picture is not 1968, obviously, because Diane was in it. Um, but it was made in 68, and it was one of the, what was called the equipment pieces, so, which we really made so that what determined how you moved was the physical equipment. Um, and you, you always did have a, a film on you, right? Yeah, the, the Simone Forti, she made the film also. She did? I thought Judd Yakut made the film. Uh, I think she's in the film. She's in the film, yeah. And, and partly because it gives you the illusion of free fall, that these people are in space, because you're moving very slowly, right? Very slowly with no accents. Um, wait, before you go to the next one, 
I think I don't have a slide of it because it was only small, low res. So either the year after this or a couple years after this, she made Walking on the Walls. So instead of having it slightly slanted, of course, there was the absolute vertical wall. This was the first time I saw Tricia, 1971, at the Whitney. And the people really did walk on the walls with, um, uh, with harnesses. And it was sort of the era of drugs and hallucinatory <laughs> experiences. And you really, when you looked at them walking on the wall, you just were like, wait a minute, am I? looking dead, how am I looking? Why are these, why am I seeing the tops of these people's heads? It was very trippy. Um, and they also had to learn to walk really slowly like you guys had to for planes. Um, so, and that walking on the wall was kind of repeated in the beginning of Set and Reset, right? You'll see in five minutes. Oh good, we'll see it, yeah. <laughs> we'll see how it began. It's sort of a reprise of, of walking on the wall. And as Trisha would say, why, why does everyone dance in the center of the space? I feel sorry for the walls and the ceilings and, and the outside of buildings, all the other spaces. In that same concert in 71, she did Sky Map, which was, it was the last piece. So everyone left their seats and everyone's lying down like this. The audience is lying down, no dancers, and you're looking up at the wall and you're hearing Trisha's beautiful voice telling you to close your eyes. And so you close your eyes and then you hear her talking to you about the map of the United States and horses galloping through different states. And so you just, it's like you close your eyes and you share her dream. You just, it's, and, and her voice is, it's on tape somewhere, right? It's they, fantastic. They, they still do it at, at yeah. galleries and stuff like that. So that was the second piece, I, this was like a triple header at the Whitney in 1971. The third one was Trisha and Barbara Dilly doing, I think, no, it wasn't Leaning Duets. I don't know the name of it, where they, it was kind of like what I showed you with um, Lightfall, um, but it was like one of them would just stand there and start to fall in one way or another, and the other one would have to catch her. I think there was a pad down like that. Falling duets. Falling duets, mm -hmm. falling duets. And, it was the most kinetically exciting thing I've ever seen. You know, to describe it, it's nothing, but when you would see, and Trisha was so mischievous, you know, and so was Barbara Dilly, and you'd see her start to fall, and then they would fake each other out, and then they'd at the last minute run and catch them. And it, it was just gorgeous. And, and so those are the first three pieces that I saw of Trisha's and great. Um, so let's see the next one. This is on the horizontal um, theme. And the one time that I saw Floor of the Forest during that time, like 19, it was at Loeb Student Center here at NYU, um, and which no longer exists. I think the skirball is on top of it. Um, and Trisha did Floor of the Forest with um, a garage sale underneath it. So there was that the ropes, the cargo netting, and then there are clothes, and the task of the dancers is to go through the clothes and, and just keep going through the clothes. So one of the things it does, and when I saw it redone at um, some gallery, I realized if you watch the audience, the audience is moving. The audience is like going like this and like this. So it's not, they're standing around in, in a gallery rather than sitting in place. Um, and when I saw it, Trisha was literally selling off old clothes underneath the cargo netting at, at Loeb Student Center. Um, so that's another example of her love of horizontality, um, which I forgot to say one of the, I felt like one of the paradoxes is flying yet not flying, like more like hovering than flying. Um, okay, let's see the next one. So uh, I feel like Trisha had a connection to the air. And as we talked about spaces, the wall, <coughs> outside of buildings. And um, this is Babette Mangold's famous picture. And I don't know who that is, but this is Douglas Dunn up there. Do you know who that is? I don't. I don't know. Um, and 
it's also her feeling about being part of the environment. It was, you know, rather than dance being a separate thing that's in a theater, it's part of the environment. And there was a series of, um, like, gestures that went back and forth, right? So they were watching each other. And the audience was up there, too. It was done a couple of years ago at the High Line, um, redone a couple, and at the Modern in the big atrium. So again, it made the audience have to go, oh, oh, there's someone, oh, there's someone, like that. So it makes the audience more active. That's one of the, that's one of the accomplishments that, that Tricia did. Um, and there it is at the High Line. Um, also, the one before, you want to go back one? Thank you so much, Kim. Also, this photo became the emblem of Soho in Europe. And when we traveled in Europe in 75, in Germany, that was used as a big banner. And it was used in several different cities in Europe. And I think it's still sort of an iconic photo. Um, symbolizing all that, the difference that Tricia brought and, and the human person in the, in the environment. Um, OK. And this one I love just because it's so Tricia. And um, primary accumulation is done on the ground. Um, it's usually done with all women. I think it's always done with all women. Very simple gestures. And part of what Tricia felt at Judson Dance Theater, um, which was very influenced by John Cage, um, and she later said she felt a pressure to just do very simple things and not do very technical things. But I think it was part of a larger project at Judson Dance Theater to take everything back to the beginning, to just, you know, Steve Paxton walked, Yvonne Rayner ran, Trisha leaned. Um, <clears throat> and I felt like they were all going, let's, let's scrub this clean. Let's not do what Martha Graham and Doris Humphrey did. Let's see who we are, starting totally at the beginning. And of all of them, I think Trisha's the one who built up a whole vocabulary from the very simple, you know, lying down um, accumulation. One, one, two. I just taught this at Bard, so I know it. One, <laughs> two, three. Actually, one, two, three, I think. Um, so it's really Tricia thinking, what can I do that's not assumed, that's not a contraction of release, a tombe pas de bourree, a flamenco, you know, that's not something that already exists, just simple gestures. Um, and when you watch all four women do it, it's like the most sensual thing. So another one of these paradoxes is the straight line against the sensuality of the human body, because Tricia was so fascinated with straight lines. And this was all straight, straight. And all the women, when they moved, they had to be, you guys had to be like angle, perfect angle, like that. And um, so, no, I think that's number 14, actually, of 30, of 30 moves. So next one. So then her love of nature, she took primary accumulation and brought it to the lake, a lake in Minneapolis. And this blows my mind that these women on the lake, on the rafts, were, could stay together. There's no music, you know, they're just like counting and they just, do you guys have to rehearse this a lot? Like you're breathing and I mean, it's amazing to me. So this was the company right before I joined. Um, the piece was made in 73, this, this might have been in 74 and I joined the company in 75. And Di joined the company in 80. 80. So, so that, was only a few, that was only two years after I left. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, next one. So this is now one of the things. So Diane is the co-director of the company now. And, and they place these, this kind of thing in other, in other sites. So it's still kind of site specific. And where is this one? Well, I think that's in Australia. I mean, yeah, it says Melbourne, right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's some, some big train station, not a train station, but I don't know what that is. So yeah, uh, that's now a performance space maybe. Um, so it's up to Diane and Carolyn Lucas to 
figure out how to put these old works in a new, in a new site. Um, okay. And this is another example of that. So this was figure eights, which was a diabolical, which is, still is, um, accumulation and deaccumulation. Um, and you're supposed to close your eyes so that you don't cheat. But it's, you are going, with one arm, you're going one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And the other arm, you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, six. So it's like one, it's like one, one, two, one, two, three, one, like that. So you're counting opposite with the two sides of your body, which also takes incredible concentration. Um, and, that, and I think that's part of Trisha's idea of performing with concentration. Um, and she was very mathematical too. Okay, next one. So this is um, Spanish dance, which was done to Bob Dylan's rendition of Early Morning Rain, and you might have seen it. So it's, it's, it's made, I don't think it was made for the proscenium, but you can do it in a proscenium if you block it out from proscenium arch to proscenium arch. And it's just, it's just like this. You wanna, you wanna show it with me? Sure. <laughs> you be in front. So, okay, so she's standing there, and the music, the music comes, and I'm, I'm just doing this treading, and I bring my arms up in fake um, Spanish. Mm, it feels so good. I always like this. <laughs> mm. And we just inch long. <laughs> Don't you want to do it? Thank you. We could have the whole class do it. <laughs> so, and it was one, it was a line dance. It was another, it was a line dance. And again, it was the straight line against the sensuality of the body. And everyone loved that it would end, we, it would be marked out really clearly. So it would end like the last note would be like right there. Um, so that was Spanish dance. And, and it was, there were a number of line dances that got put into a larger dance called Line Up, which in some ways was a precursor to Set and Reset, the idea of lining up. Um, and oh, then that's me, the second. That one. Between Trisha and Elizabeth. Um, okay. So another line, this was Spirals, where, um, and this was not in lineup because it took equipment to do it. Um, but the person, the dancer, got rigged, again, just like walking on the walls. And then, Diane, someone releases something up top. They release something. Um, and they basically just hoist themselves onto the tree or column. And the, off of, there's a ladder there. And the ladder goes away. And they begin the descent. And so she, so she stays perpendicular to the tree. And again, she looks so calm, and it only takes five seconds or something. It's just, they just go around like that. And again, it's like Trisha envisioning the human body in nature. Um, they've done it indoors, too. Okay. And oh, if we have time, I'll show you a little of water motor, which is like dessert. Yes. Um, but this is, this is a picture of Trisha doing water motor, which is, which is Trisha envisioning improvisation as choreography, really or envisioning choreography as, as organic as um, improvisation. Um, this is Opa Loop, and the, the um, visual collaborator was Na, uh, Na, Nakaya, what? Fujiko Nakaya. Fujiko Nakaya, who's Japanese, and um, she created steam so that it actually made noise. That was the sound too. It was like, Psh! and then that would go on and then it would stop. And so again, the element of chance, like how would the steam cover up the bodies? Different every time. And that was Trisha's willingness to, um, to use chance. And the costumes are fantastic. Trisha had this taffeta number. It's f and then this is Steve Paxton. Um, no, not Steve Petronio, Steve Petronio, sorry, with the, like a frog looking thing. And then Lisa Krauss was in just flesh colored or bone colored um, unitard. 
and you can't see Eva Karth like she was in sort of a nightgown. So each costume was very different. So the movement flowed differently on each person. Um, okay. And here's what we were talking about. So there's Diane on top, um, where they aided her in walking on the walls. And that's how set, and, you'll see it, that's how set and reset starts. It's a recap of the whole idea of walking on the walls. And it actually happens after, in the original, there's this huge um, Robert Rauschenberg set that you see the light, you hear things, the set changes, it's, it's sitting in the whole performance space. And then the set levitates, it rises, 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 and clears the space. So the whole thing of rising and being airborne is already set out by the Rauschenberg set. Um, and, and the costumes were kind of news, newsprint silk screened on these, these little slippery things. Okay. So this is another horizontal thing where I, I like the hovering really happened here a lot. In lateral pass, um, is that Randy that's rigged? Um, so Randy was the only dancer rigged. Everyone else was on the floor and just one dancer was rigged to sort of hover over them. Uh, some music. Peter Zumo did the music, right? Yeah yeah. 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 And the costumes were by Nancy Graves. Oh, and that on the right is David Thompson, who you may have seen because he's freelance with everybody. Um, and this, I don't think this is the real costumes because the costumes were very carnival y. Yeah, like she seems to have an, ad, is that, that's Carolyn? Yes. Maybe. And she has some added thing. And Vicky Schick was wearing a tutu, I remember. <laughs> like a thing like this, and she did these very slow balances. Um, okay. And another sort of horizontal play, this was, this was um, Newark. Do you know Newark? Is, is it? It's my all the partnering, the group work in Newark is like astonishing um, because it's not just lifting someone up, it's like getting stuck on someone. <laughs> and um, uh, how would you describe the partnering in well, Newark? It's, it's sort of like equipment pieces but with bodies instead of equipment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, didn't Trisha call like furniture? Like well, she, the, was, uh, yeah, earlier in it, the, the yes, male, the, you know, yeah, furniture true. moving. Mm -hmm. Kind of, she really wanted to have her dancing be more male because it was really so female, so airborne, and so articulate. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to do like this. Um, and and then there were Donald Judd drops that dropped in front of it. And again, like the chance thing, if if that drop bisected the dance, she she had to deal with it. Although by the time it was performed, there was nothing left to chance. I think. Um, she, yeah, yeah. I think she was generous to her collaborators. I mean, she basically said to Don Judd, do what you want. He said, okay, I want this big red drop to come down in front and have three minutes of no dancing. Um, but it is a, it, it's like, it's a piece with such gravitas. Um, and it's not gravitas from an, a narrative or an emotional thing. It's just, it's like from color and shape and contact and the sound, which was like a drilling sound. You like the sound, Donald? I love, I just love the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know, the, the, the phrasing within it is just, it's just so nice. Yeah, it it's, it's amazing. And so different from set and reset. It's so much grounded like boulders mm -hmm. rather than air. Okay. And that's you die, right? Yes. So this is L'Orfeo, the opera, and she directed this opera, right? Mm -hmm. And I was almost going to ask you for the video again, but we have enough things to look at. Um, but in the video, you see that all of these horizontal things that she's been thinking about come into play as narrative, as part of the opera. And so that Musica character, you want to say something about the character?
And you had like the riggers, um, the rigging by Roy yeah, f Floyd, yeah, from the circus and everything. Yeah, yeah. it was it was so beautiful. And I interviewed Trisha once about it, and she said that she felt like like you, your like musica was like angels looking over the edge or something. <laughs> Look, like I think she talked about the Sistine Chapel. The ceiling painting. She was interested the, in ceiling painting. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, so she turned it on its side. Yeah. The same, so the same thing that you're talking about is taking a, a, a horizontal and now making a vertical yeah. view, and it's in an aperture, a circular aperture. Yeah. So it really does um, appear to be a ceiling painting. Yeah, appearing to be a ceiling painting. Yeah, and of course it's done to that part of the opera. It's, it's just such a beautiful beginning to the whole opera. Um, so in, in this, in this um, theme of paradox, I'm going to show you part of Glacial Decoy, um, which people say was the first proscenium piece. I don't say that because I was in Splang in 1978, which we did on a proscenium stage around the corner at Joe's pu at Public Theater. Um, but it wasn't specifically for a proscenium stage. This is specifically for it. So. So she had a few things going on, and she, uh, when she went on to the proscenium stage, she asked Robert Rauschenberg to help her envision coming on to a stage, rather than all these more intimate um, spaces where she was in. So he created a series of photographs that marched from stage right to stage left. So you could read them, actually. Like you could see the light bulb change from here to here to here to here. So while you were reading those visual images, you were seeing the dancers come in and out. And the illusion that they created together was first of all that the photographs went off the page, and secondly that the dancers were working in a space that was too wide for the stage. So the dancers went back and forth as though they were keeping going. You wouldn't see the dancer anymore, but they would keep going. And then, then the dancer would come back and join the other ones. So the illusion was that the proscenium just happened to be too narrow for the dance. And that was the way that she um, interrogated what, you know, what was a stage, what's a proscenium stage. And then we'll talk about set and reset too, because that was after, this was 79. Um, and he did the costumes too, which, which flow and are translucent. And didn't he want them to be nude underneath? I think he wanted. They were nude. Oh, they were nude underneath. They had underwear. They had some underwear, but not other underwear. And I think some. Did Trisha change the lighting or something so that you, they wouldn't look totally nude? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, oh, the other thing about this was it was in silence. So I know presenters who will not present this piece because they do not think their audience will sit for silence. So in that way, it was um, a renegade, you know, okay, I'm going into a theater, I have this great artist, we've got this great idea, but there's no music. So some presenters are just afraid of it. They're just, you know, no, my audience won't stand for that, won't sit for that. Um, but I've never seen an audience get restless because it's so beautiful. It's like 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and the Paris Opera Ballet did this one. Was, yeah. Wasn't this the one they did? So the Paris Opera Ballet was the first ballet company that, um, uh, that did a Trisha Brown piece. And they're also the first ballet company that commissioned a Trisha Brown piece after they did this in case you're interested in ballet companies. So you can see, like if you followed that tire and mailbox, it would go, it would keep going. And meanwhile, of course, the movement is exquisite.
So you see how the weight, it's like, the, she, she lets the weight pull you back. No. You want to turn that off? The, and Yeah, I think um, I think it was brave of Stephen to take this piece into his company. Oh, I, yeah, um, it really makes me happy. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, so let's do. Um, I think I don't want to do set and reset. Let's do this one, the one that, the um, fourteen so olos. In the early days of Trisha's work, it was very much about what was logical for her. And you know, this was very logical, and she would talk about this, 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 you get down here, you get a very, very logical movement. And it, that was like a foundation for taking off from that logic. And, and I will show you water, water motor where, where it's, it's, it's a little bit like this one, um, glacial where the body just, the weight of the body just sort of swoops you down and carries you up like you're sort of carried in a hurricane. Um, but um, this, this one is, uh, this is solo olos, which was the basic phrase that we learned for lineup. And everything else was either improvising, lining up, or, or lineup dances. Um, and what you'll see now was not part of a piece, it was like, a memory thing, like here's the building block, let's video, I didn't even remember videotaping it until I saw it in this thing, like oh, we did that. And that was, it was really just to hold on to the phrase, like here's the phrase, and because we did the phrase backward and forward and with spill and with branch, and, and we just wanted to get the phrase down. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so she asked me to tape this with her. Um, the tape is by uh, Davidson Giuliani filmed this because he lived upstairs or next door or something. Um, and this, you'll see the sort of logic of this. And it always amazes me how slow it is, because you guys do it much faster now, right? I think, I imagine, Wendy, that it, it's as slow as it is because you just... We were still remembering it. Well, I think you just re had probably figured out the reversal. Yeah. So, I and you, so I'll show you at the point where it reverses. So we had to know how to reverse it from any point in the phrase. And so we would rehearse it. Um, because we got, there was a caller saying when to reverse. So, and she would put these kind of dives in with this very logical um, progression. Okay, reverse. So now we're, we're reversing it exactly. Also called retrograde. So to figure that out in your own body, and I, as I remember, she didn't show us the reverse. She just said, you work on it and do the reverse of it. Um, and so there are all these slow downs and speed ups. Um, unfalls. What? Unfalls. 
unfalls. Oh, I never heard that term. Un yeah. So th this is, you know. But that means she worked it out separately herself. We all, we all worked it out separately, as I remember. Um, and then Mona, who was the person calling it, had to recognize where everybody was in their phrase. And she would say, Wendy reverse, Trisha spill. So she would play like, like um, a video game, you know, like controlling everybody until they all got back together again. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's pure. So, as I said, we never we never did it that way, like just two people in unison, and we learned we learned more complicated versions of it. Um, but this was our like basic building block. Okay, let's, yeah. So from there, so that was made in like 76, 77. Then in 78, Trisha started making water motor. And we would come in every morning and she would have made like another two seconds of it. <laughs> and it was just amazing to see it build. Um, so this is water motor. Again, no music, just Trisha and her body. And this is Babette Mangold's film. Um, should we turn off these lights? Yeah. That walking in the middle of dancing, that's something that happens in a lot of pieces. So while, she, while you see the slow motion, I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, one thing that you notice is she doesn't do first position with the arms like this. It's not built on the ballet vocabulary. The arms are more sagittal, and you feel the weight of the arms. That's just one of the things. Um, and the impulses are all from the body. It's, it's nothing from the outside. And also the way she performs. Again, it's not like I am performing for you, the audience. It's more like I'm experimenting with my body. Yeah. 
And again, it's those lines. Like she knows exactly where in space she's making those lines. This is that walking, as I mentioned. And so that pedestrian thing of, of like Judson Dance Theater, that's still there. They'll be walking, they'll be running. Even in Set and Reset, there's walking and running. So her whole idea of virtuosity is completely different than anyone else's idea of virtuosity. Whoa. Is that even a concept for her, do you think? There's what? Is virtuosity a concept for her? I don't know, Diane, what do you think? And articulation, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think articulation is a big thing. Um. I'm happy to tell you that every undergrad at Tisch has seen this because I showed him the first day of comp class. <laughs> yes, that's, a, that's what Donald said. Yeah. Do you really? That's I wonderful. do. To blow holes in their yeah. perception of what's yeah. possible, you know? Yeah. It does the trick. I yeah. What, what? I want to blow holes in your perception. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I want to have Trisha Brown's help. That's great. I ask people to look at it from a movement technique point of view mm. is to see that every footfall is exactly where she wants it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. or out of it. And the other thing is that I think that oftentimes dancers' perception of Trisha's style is that, is that there's a lot of movement. Yes, there is, but it's mostly in hip sockets, shoulders, and that the torso, even though it's responsive and full, is not generating Listening to every, yeah. Yes. When I say every, listening, I mean meditating on yeah, every yeah. place and every moment yeah. and every, you know, yeah. not leaving it alone. Yeah. Which is why maybe it took her, you know, mm. a whole day to do like a few. A few, right. Moments. And years to go from the very careful thing yeah. to, okay, now I am going to fly. Because yeah. she always wanted to fly. I have to convince the students every year that she's not improvising, this is no. choreographed. Right. And there was a year where we saw it, and then I took 20 of them to the Bessies, and Neil Beasley did the dance at the oh. Bessies, oh, and they couldn't believe it. Yeah. Um, well, and she wanted it to look like improv. She wanted to get the feeling of improvising, yeah. I think, that tearing into it feeling, you know. And so she worked really hard to get, to get that. And I love the slow motion, because you can see yeah. where in the body things are starting. Yeah. And, and how she's making shapes. So she eventually spliced this into um, standing accumulation. Oh. There we are. Yay, Trisha. <laughs> so we want to turn the lights on again. Um, so that's, uh, I guess my, I'm not going to conclude because you're going to see what, what Diane has done with the students. And um, uh, it's what I like about the set and reset reset project is that as a dancer, you do have to put your mind into it as well as your body in whatever kind of project you're working on with, with Tricia. Um, anything else you want to say? About the set and reset. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like as a, as a model for any education project to give dancers the opportunity to not only have it something in terms of a movement technique, but also a compositional technique mm -hmm. and the rigor um, by going through the same steps that Trisha did. Um, and uh, I mean, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think that the dancers here are absolutely 
that's great. And so I think for, for set and reset, she took, she had phrases that she taught them, and then you guys have five things that you do, and one of them is lining up, right? Mm -hmm. And that, which is what our piece was in 76, was just line up, and you know, that was one of the things, and one of them was act on instinct, so you can see there's a lot of instinct in this. And another one was use the sides of the space, so it wasn't always everything in the center. And Trisha always did a lot in the you know, marginal areas of the space. And one was keep it simple. One of the, and um, uh, what was, oh, visibil visibility and invisibility. Work with visibility and invisibility. And, and there are things in Set and Reset that are just amazing with how you think something's happening, but then someone disappears and it's not happening. Or, or I love the part, and I only, it's only because I've seen the video a few times recently where you're, you're something like this, and Trisha comes barreling over, takes your hand, oh, throws the big throw, you, the big throw <laughs> throws you across the stage, and suddenly there's Stephen Petronio catching you. It's like, it's like a sequence that you just, you go, blah, 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 you know. It's like someone changing languages or something so fast you can't even think. Yeah, because she once said something like, um, um, I'd be embarrassed if I made the dancer skip from here to yeah. there. <laughs> you know, like that's the modern dance thing. Well, if you have to be over there, just skip. And she said, I'd, I'd be embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why there's walking too. Yeah, um, exactly. But um, yeah, maybe because she did so much of this that then traveling steps was, was a problem. Yeah. Or walking on the walls, that's another way to travel. Yeah. yeah. So any questions of either Di or me? Yeah, Charlotte. Um, which choreographers um, who came before Trisha was Trisha most inspired by, would you say? I would say Simone Forti. She worked with Simone in the studio. I think she basically learned to improvise from Simone more than from Anna Halperin. Um, who else do you think she was? I think it was visual art. She was very into visual yeah, art. And I think there were visual artists that she was inspired by. Um, can you think of any either visual artists or dance artists that she was inspired by? I know it wasn't Martha Graham. She said, I don't know if you ever heard this, she said, um, I don't understand why Martha Graham blows her wad with every movement. <laughs> so Trisha. <laughs> And the thing is, Trisha was so unemphatic. She just did like a contract and release and a no, 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 you know. She just like didn't get it. Like, what, you know, why go through all that, you know? If she didn't think of dance as a hysterical, emotional thing. Um, but she was very influenced by John Cage, Merce Cunningham and John Cage. And she, later in life, I remember she asked Merce, how do you actually come up with the movement choices? Um, which I don't think she was so concerned about early on because her work was so different from Merce's. You know, Merce was very directional and positional, and she was just like, mm -hmm. but anyone else you can think of? I, mean, that I just feel like her collaboration with Bob was so... Robert Rauschenberg, yeah. yeah. Um, not like he, he was her mentor, they were equals, and yeah. they just played off of each other, so... Yeah. Yeah. And I know she named a work of his Pelican. That was her mm -hmm. title. Mm -hmm. So they, they did work back and forth. They had so many similar similarities, like they yeah. would play with language and titling things. They, they really had a lot of fun with that. That's nice. Yeah. The movement that she made, did that come from improvisation? I mean, when you said, like, you come into the studio, she'd have two more seconds made. Was that her just being in her body, in her practice? And then setting it and then sharing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, with, with water motor, she didn't share it. That was just for her. Yeah. But um, 
but solo olos, she, she shared that. You know, we have to do it exactly this way. Or, or um, primary, it was like you had to do Heather, your fingers exactly her way. She was very detailed, very detail oriented in that. Yeah. But her, I think she wanted dancers to feel like, like they were improvising, like they owned it. I mean, yeah. the, the sense of it not being arbitrary is like so extraordinary. You know, whenever I see her work, I always come away wanting to choreograph mm -hmm. because it's like yeah. it's it's like she she does something she goes okay let's stay with this for a minute and yeah. I'll leave it and yeah. what is this yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah I'm gonna just change one aspect of it yeah okay you know and that that kind of intensity and, and, patience. and concentration Enormous patience. Uh, I find beautiful just I so beautiful. I agree and I've seen concerts recently yeah. where it's like oh we're doing this and we're doing this and they're you know exactly. they're flinging themselves all over and I'm thinking did you think about that you know yeah. and I also heard her once say like I think she actually said this and I forget what piece she was working on I think it was after I left the company she said I would go to the guillotine for every movement I've chosen yeah. in this yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean really yeah. Yeah. yeah because it's so considerate yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. In terms of the weight, in terms of the shape, in terms of what happened before, and blah, blah, blah. you know, it's like mm -hmm. amazing, really. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear you use the word arbitrary. I just said that very same word and put it in a note to one of the dancers. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, in a, in a moment that I left a little bit loose, mm. I was checking in with him. Okay, what, what are you working on? Because it had started to evolve a little uh -huh, bit. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. And he's, okay, got it. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, that's the, that's the uh, uh, virtuosity, if you want to use that word. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a virtuosity of meditation yeah. <laughs> something. Yeah. You know? Definitely. Yeah. You know, really. Presence. Definitely. Presence. Oh, just presence like, 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 yeah. like this. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, know, you have to be <laughs> listening to the whole thing. You know? it's like, and, okay. and she would say, because I remember when I was on tour with her and right. they were doing this, and I actually didn't do it on tour, but she said, when I do this accumulation, I am thinking this is all there is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So her concentration was just like you blot out everything else and you raise your hand like this is all there is. Mm -hmm. And that, that's hard to get people to do, you know, dancers to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, did dancers ever speak or vocalize in Patricia's work? I don't think so. She's, in the early work, she spoke um, in um, Yellow Belly. Oh, and what else? Pamplona Stones. Pamplona Stones, they spoke. Yeah, this was early, like in the 60s. And Yellow Belly was, um, I guess, like in Seattle, they would call you Yellow Belly if they thought you were a coward. And so she would stand there and go, call me Yellow, Yellow Belly. <laughs> and also in Grand Union, which was from 70 to 76, she spoke, and she, she's just brilliant. I mean, whenever you talked, and, and whenever she would speak, um, she, David Gordon and Trisha were like both just brilliant talkers. It, Trisha more spare, <laughs> David more ongoing. Um, but they would both speak in Grand Union, which was the improvisation group that I'm writing a book about. Yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> So um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Diane. I'm so glad you were here. Yeah.